Washington mornings on the mall. At AM 6.30. on WMAL, where Washington comes to talk. And it looks like Senator Rand Paul is unavailable for us this morning. We're going to continue to try to reach him. But listen, he's a senator. He's got a very busy life, as you can well imagine. You know, you pressed Representative Steve King on whether he was going to run for uh, right. Senator Harkin's seat in Iowa. I was hoping that you would have the same energy yeah. as Rand Paul if he was running for president. Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that and how it might be a, a really interesting candidacy. Uh, I think he might be a, a very interesting addition to that debate and to that can conversation. I, can I, I would can I like just, to see him do it. Can I just tell you that somebody with the last name of Paul will be running for president for the rest of our lifetime? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, trust me on this one. Hey, by the way, there's a new bit of information that just came out that has to do about the economy. You remember yesterday, the news was not so good when we learned that there had been shrinkage. Why do you have to use that word? Well, because that's what it was. There was shrinkage As in Stuart the economy. As Stuart Barney said, that is not a good word to use in the wintertime. Okay, but it was shrinkage in the economy. Oh. Uh, the uh, the GDP uh, contracted by 0.1%. Well, in the last few minutes, we've just gotten some new information that says that jobless rates, uh, initial jobless claims, rose 38,000 to 368 initial jobless claims last week. Wow. All right. I'm so just I'm on the cutting I'm edge. You. Well, I, I mean, appreciate but that's your breaking news. But that's a, that's that's a good question. Though. Who's responsible for all this? Uh, well, the good news is I mean, that would be Obama. Bad news, Republicans. Just get it straight. Okay. Uh, joining us now on our newsmaker headline is the aforementioned senator from the great state of Kentucky, uh, Senator Rand Paul. All right, Senator Paul. You know, you kept us waiting there for about a minute, so that means we're not going to let you off the hook. Are you or are you not running for president? We want a yes or no. <laughs> this is it. You got to live with the answer. Breaking news this morning. Uh, you know. I might. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I guess we'll take that. Boy, what is with all these waffling politicians today? <laughs> no, I shock. tell you. I tell you. Uh, well, well, I do thank you for joining us today, and I would love to start uh, and talk to you about immigration first because that has been a big topic this week, and a lot of your colleagues, uh, they're calling the Gang of Eight, uh, came up with what they're calling a bipartisan approach to the immigration problem in America. I'm interested in, first, your reaction to their proposals or what you know of them. Well, you know, there's this kind of an outline, and I still want to try to influence it. The main thing that I want to tell people is that we do have to figure out what to do with the 11 million who are here that are undocumented. But whatever we do, however we decide to normalize them, we can't then be a beacon for 11 million more people to come in illegally. So you have to have a secure border. I'm for having a secure border that's verified. I sort of believe in the trust, but verify. And the way I would do it is I would have a report that's issued every year for five years. Congress would have to vote on the report. The report would indicate whether the border is secure or not secure. And if it's not passed and we don't agree that it's secure, then the reforms don't continue going forward. I think it would take several years to process 11 million people. Yep. The other thing I, I am going to... Uh, request and maybe insist on is that there are two lines one lines to get into the country and then the other lines for the green card if they're going to put 11 million people immediately in the green card line that means they get to go in front of the people who are applying for citizenship legally or applying for entry into the country legally i think you have to be uh, you can't get in front of anybody in either line really is, yeah. is what, what i would think would be the best way yeah. to do it but uh, I do believe we need to talk about immigration reform, and we essentially have de facto amnesty now. The 11 million are here. They're not really paying taxes. They are working, most of them, but let's get them into the system. If we're going to keep them here, let's get them into the system, but let's don't do it in such a way that we become a beacon for another 11 million people to come, because I do agree with what Friedman said, and that you can't have open borders in a welfare state. Well, you, you, you're talking as if that uh, you, you have some real concerns about how it might go forward, but you have written and said that you think the GOP needs to evolve on this issue. Absolutely. In what ways does the GOP need to evolve? In the sense that I think in the past people have been for uh, putting them on a bus and sending them home. They've been talking about self-deportation and a lot of things that I think are not the best way to approach this issue. I, I personally say the 11 million people, if you want to work, we're going to figure out a way for you to stay. But that does have to be in the context of having secure borders. So I am for changing uh, the rhetoric on what the GOP has been saying. I am for, for making sure that every Latino uh, person in our country knows that we see immigrants as an asset, not as a liability, that we don't have uh, an animus towards uh, people who have immigrated, that we were all immigrants once. 
So I am for changing the tone and rhetoric and also for immigration reform if we can figure out how to do it with a secure border. Senator Rand Paul is our guest. He's from the state of Kentucky. And I, I have to ask you, I know that you just uh, had a visit to Israel last month over the holidays, and uh, it, it sounds like you really enjoyed yourself and it was a very informative trip. I'm guessing that a lot of the politicians you met up with expressed concern over Iran. And we just had the news that Iran has been able to successfully launch a, a rocket into orbit. They put a monkey up there, uh, Senator Paul. Uh, and, and that sort of escalated escalates the concern that people have over Iran. Can I ask you this? If the United States of America can stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, should they? Well, you know, I think that's a real question is, one, can we? And then the other question is whether we can do it um, diplomatically or whether it requires war to do it. And that still is an open-ended question. Um, I voted for the sanctions against Iran I think they would be more effective and we could potentially get Iran to cooperate diplomatically if we could uh, get Russia and China involved with helping us in this. A lot of the oil that goes from Iran through the Straits of Hormuz goes out to the east, goes to India, Japan, China, Russia. I think if you don't have input from China and Russia, we're never going to get them talked down. But I think we should use our leverage with trade the large trade that we have with both China and Russia and encourage them that it be in their best interest to talk Iran down. But, but, but if, I mean, listen, a lot of people say that it's impossible to talk to uh, Ahmadinejad because he's not a reasonable player in this. If it turns out that military intervention is the only way to keep Iran from having a nuclear weapon, is that a course we should take? I think all options are on the table, but I think it's hard to uh, come come down with a final conclusion when we don't know exactly what the future brings yet. So, uh, you know, I do agree with those who have said all options are on the table. Those include military, but those also include diplomatic. And I don't think we've exhausted the, the diplomatic or the sanctions. I was so happy to see that you took Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to task about Benghazi in a, in a serious way yes. in those recent hearings. But I think we still have a lot of unanswered questions about that, and it seems that the administration is dragging its feet and giving even the most rudimentary answers to long-standing questions both of Congress and the press on this matter. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing we learned is that she did not read the cables that were pleas for help, asking for more security. She didn't read those before the ambassador was killed, and I think that's inexcusable. And I really think disqualifies her from being in a position where she could make these decisions again. The other thing that I think she missed on this is that they treated the embassy in Libya like it was the embassy in Paris. And I would have treated the embassy in Libya like it was the embassy in Iraq. It's in a war zone. I think it should have been, the security should have always been under the Department of Defense, or we shouldn't have had an embassy there. And I think even the review board missed this. They had 64 good suggestions of things that Secretary Clinton failed to do, all common sense things she should have done in advance. And I think these are good changes. But even the review board didn't really assess whether or not uh, maybe this should be uh, under the command of the Department of Defense, which is, I think, uh, really, I think we're in danger for another tragedy there, Yemen, Somalia, a lot of different places around the world. We're, we're, if we're relying on the host country to protect our embassy, uh, even in Egypt right now, I think our embassy is threatened. All right, Senator Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, uh, the Super Bowl was this weekend. Are you uh, backing your colleague, Senator Barbara Boxer and Senator Dianne Feinstein's 49ers? Well, I'm rooting for Coach Harbaugh. <laughs> oh, what? you know what? All right, he's running for president. Do you know, that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's, the, co- do you know the coaches Harbaugh have a connection to Bowling Green? Their dad coached at Western Kentucky University. I didn't know that. And Jim Harbaugh actually uh, was uh, connected with uh, Western Kentucky and helping out the team when his dad was there. Well, all oh, roads all right. lead to Kentucky. We can all agree on that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Paul.